one of the topics that has interested me for a long time is the sort of interplay uh, or the embedding, the enmeshing of, uh, of sci basic science research and, and the worlds of kind of the messy worlds of human politics. And historians and scientists have looked at that in, in, in various moments, like nuclear physics in the Cold War. Obviously, that was a topic that had immediate worldly impact uh, that was clearly not separable from the world, from the world of politics in its day. But what I've been thinking about for, for a while now is a, an area of science that's very dear to me, Einstein's general relativity. To this day, 100 years later, it remains physicists' uh, uh, best explanation for the warping of space-time, the behavior of gravitation. It's the premise for all of our thinking about the Big Bang and the universe and cosmology. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous legacy from Albert Einstein. And it also seems, unlike nuclear physics, we might think that to have been least impacted by the politics of its day. Uh, this is not about uh, uh, nuclear weapons or reactors or power. It seems to be about the ethereal, the, the most otherworldly, the least about sort of the here and now. And so what's been interesting to me as I've dug into its history over the last century is exactly how deeply embedded Einstein's relativity has been in, the, in geopolitics, uh, not less so uh, than things like nuclear physics, where we might have expected that all along. So it turns out Einstein finished uh, his version of the theory that we now uh, uh, still use in the middle of World War I. He wrote down the version that we now understand in 1915. Europe had already been engulfed in war for well over a year by that point. Well, that affected who, to whom he could uh, send news of his announcement. There were journal embargoes, so researchers in some countries couldn't even receive the journals. He, Einstein couldn't send mail back and forth in some places. He could travel some places during the war, but not others. So all of a sudden, from the very moment of, of, the, um, of the birth of this beautiful theory, it's born into a world at war, or continent at war, certainly. And that starts to impact how Einstein can interact with colleagues, share news, learn from others, who can who can work on the topic. There are all kinds of scientists who were caught at the wrong place at the wrong time. There was a very gifted Russian mathematician, Vesevalid Fredericks, who had been studying in Göttingen in Germany before war broke out. He was able to learn from Einstein directly when Einstein visited Göttingen about this new developing work. Then he was imprisoned as a civilian prisoner of war because he was suddenly on the wrong side once World War I broke out. Only after the war was he able to go back to his native St. Petersburg, and that's where he helped to train what became a world-class dominant Russian school in uh, general relativity, because he learned it from Einstein and then couldn't leave, and then only later could travel back. They were. Uh, astronomers who were captured because they wanted to make several astronomical tests to test Einstein's ideas. They left Germany. They were in the Crimea just as war broke out over and over and over again. We see the war impinging on the, on the daily working of science, even for this beautiful otherworldly topic like relativity. It turns out a little bit later, so the earliest kind of rumblings of what would grow into the Nazi movement in Germany, starting as early as 1920, quite early on after the end of World War I, Many of those kind of splinter fringe groups got their start by holding rallies against relativity. Not just against Albert Einstein, who they would have not liked for any number of reasons. They, he was Jewish, he had been an outspoken pacifist and a socialist. They didn't like Einstein for a hundred reasons. But they held rallies in huge stadiums to denounce general relativity as being against what they considered the kind of proper Aryan spirit, and against what they thought right, rightful, racially pure science should be like. They produced uh, counter ideas, they denounced the work over and over and over again. And some of those were done, again, by kind of political entrepreneurs who were helping to foment what would eventually grow into the Nazi party. Nazis had many roots, but there was an early political faction trying to make hay against relativity. Some of the topics that really caught my attention most directly when we moved then to after World War II, and a kind of center of research worldwide has now moved from Western Europe more toward the United States and as well to the Soviet Union, but there's the disruptions of the war have shifted the, the global balance of who's doing science where. And so even in the US in the height of the Cold War, we start seeing relativity being pursued in ways that are inescapably tied to the politics. One of my favorite examples, uh, for decades, the single most quantitatively precise test of Einstein's relativity, very subtle warping and bending of space-time at just, just the measurable amount, it was conducted actually uh, right here at MIT, but not on the main campus. It was conducted at one of the defense laboratories that MIT ran uh, on behalf of the U.S. Air Force, uh, Lincoln Laboratory. 
uh, Lincoln's job was to design better and better radar systems, actually to try to detect incoming Soviet missiles in the era after Sputnik. As it turns out, very few Soviet missiles were coming at the United States. And by very few, I mean zero, as we now know. But they didn't know that then. They were very worried. So this was part of a hair-trigger alert system to design better and better radars to scan the horizon to look for a telltale sign of a missile that had just been launched and might be heading towards North America. Well, because there were few missiles to practice on coming over the horizon, some of these en enterprising scientists thought they could fine-tune every piece of equipment, the radars, the early room-sized computers, the programs, the whole thing, by trying to send radar signals to the planets, like Mercury and Venus, and detect the echo. That looked an awful lot like a missile having just been launched from the Soviet Union, at least for their purposes. And then some of them realized, well, they have the best electronics in the world, or at least certainly in the Western world, uh, the most powerful radars, the biggest computers. They could then try to time the, the delay. How long did that echo take to come back? Radars, you send out a little pulse of radio waves, and you time their return, their echo. If Einstein's theory of general relativity were correct, there should have been a very, very tiny and yet measurable delay in how long those waves came back, because they would have been traveling in this warped, bent trampoline of space-time, because the big, fat sun would have changed the space-time through which that wave had traveled on its way to, say, uh, Venus or Mercury. There should have been a, a shift of about 200 microseconds, 200 millionths of a second compared to just a Newtonian uh, gravity, which few other labs in, in the world could even have tried to measure, let alone thought to, to conduct this experiment. Lo and behold, uh, they got permission to, to conduct that experiment, all in the service of fine-tuning the apparatus for defense purposes. They found a delay exactly as Einstein's theory had predicted. And for decades, that remained the single most quantitatively precise test of Einstein's theory, done as target practice to get a, a defense radar system up and running. It's another example, a very, very talented physicist, uh, Bryce DeWitt, uh, who had been fascinated by general relativity, even when that was not uh, a sort of a mainstream topic soon after World War II. Uh, he, his first main job, because he studied such a weird thing at the time, like gravity, the only job he could get was at the brand new H-bomb laboratory at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in California. His job was to work with other physicists on trying to design some of the first electronic simulations of the insides of a hydrogen bomb. Incredibly complicated hydrodynamics. How does matter flow under extreme conditions? It turns out DeWitt realized they could get the, these very early clunky simulations to, to work right if they, if they did a funny thing with their coordinates. Instead of nailing coordinates in place, here's x equals 0, here's x equals 1, here's x equals 2, they could actually attach coordinates to little test bodies. They could have dynamical coordinates. The coordinates themselves would flow, uh, and that's called Lagrangian coordinates as opposed to Eulerian coordinates. DeWitt thought of that because he'd already studied relativity, which is all about sort of dynamical space times and trying to be careful with coordinates and this sort of bumpy, squishy, trampoline-like surface. So that made some sense to him. That was the first uh, two-dimensional computer codes that made any progress at all in simulating H-bombs. A few years later, he invented or helped to invent the whole field of numerical relativity using the exact same lines of code, the exact same funny trick with coordinates to try to study on a computer things like black holes or the tugging of one large star on another, and helped invent what is now a flourishing, thriving field of basic research called numerical relativity. So time and time again, from the earliest moments of World War I, right through the height of the Cold War, we see uh, tremendously important basic research in, uh, on general relativity being conducted in, in a messy political world where the politics wasn't necessarily making bad science, it was helping certain kinds of science thrive in, in sort of surprising, in surprising ways. So even this most beautiful, ethereal, otherworldly topic like Einstein's relativity, it was tethered at every moment to the vicissitudes, to the politics of the 20th century. So does any of that matter today? Is, is general relativity now sort of uh, done with politics? Does politics have no role to play in our continuing understanding or pursuit of gravity? I don't think it's... Um, an entirely different story even after the end of the Cold War. Um, so one example that, I, that I'd like to learn more about is the Global Positioning System, or GPS. We all rely on it in our phones, in our cars. 
uh, GPS works, it's accurate, because it takes into account very specific corrections from general relativity, not just from special relativity. We have to know and put in a, a, a quantitative offset. We have to know exactly how clocks change their rates depending on the gravitational field in which they sit. That's a general relativity effect. Without it, the GPS would, would, would stop being accurate. That would be measurably off. Uh, well, it turns out a lot of that technology, again, was first developed uh, by military sponsors who had all kinds of reasons to know exactly where things were on the face of the Earth. So here's an example with an enormous investment in what was, at least in part, originally a kind of military or certainly a practical technology uh, that now has, has pervaded every corner of civilian space that was, again, sort of furthering and depending on a very subtle study of general relativity. So, uh, so it's not only the era of you know, World War II mainframes or Cold War missiles. I think whenever we try to do uh, fancy, expensive science, uh, we have to worry about how's it going to get paid for. We have to worry about resources. And then we're back in the world of human politics. So then the question is, does politics help fundamental science? And there, I think there's no single answer. I think there are examples even from this history of general relativity where politics clearly does damage to the pursuit of science. If scientists can't talk to each other, if they can't send postcards to each other, if they can't get each other's journals, it's hard to see how that's helping science along. That seems like a horrible impediment, let alone the, the, the hatreds and the nationalisms and the distrust uh, that, can, that can drive a scientific community apart. So certainly there are plenty of examples where politics is not helping science. And then there are some of these unexpected twists and turns where politics certainly helped set priorities, which helped enable resources to be spent in some areas that as a often unintended byproduct produced Im amazingly important science. That might not have been the reason those, those programs were built or funded by, say, the US Department of Defense. But that doesn't mean they squelched science. In fact, there were ways in which they definitely, definitely advanced science. So I think, I, think it's, uh, I think there's no single answer. Is politics good or bad for science? I think we find plenty of examples on each side of, of the balance there. <laughs>